Okay, uh, so welcome to the weekly webinar from Easy Power. Uh, my name is David Castor, and we're going to be talking about uh, some uh, power flow uh, topics, um, just maybe a little bit beyond the basics of power flow, but still uh, nothing too complicated, I don't think. So anyway, I haven't done one of these for a while, so I have to see if we can get the hang of it. Um, what we're going to talk about uh, in the next oh, 45 minutes or so is uh, how to scale the loads and particularly the motors in your model to get a realistic um, power flow. And we'll look at an example of that. And we're going to talk about um, what controls the real power, the kilowatts, and also what controls the reactive power, the VARs or KVARs that show up in the results. And so you get an understanding of the impact of changes you make and how you can adjust the voltages and power outputs and those kind of things. We're going to take a look at generator settings. There are some options for the power flow uh, configuration of generators that, that are only a, have an impact on power flow. And we're going to take a look at those options. We're going to look at an instance of multiple utility sources in power flow. Easy Power allows you to have uh, as many sources as you want. And uh, we'll take a look at that. You can have different uh, control angle between the power sources that controls the uh, power flow from each source. And we'll touch briefly on configuring uh, transformers that have uh, load tap changers, on load tap changers and how we can use that capability to simulate uh, step type voltage regulators if, if you need to model those. And finally we'll spend a few minutes talking about troubleshooting. Um, you can run into situations in power flow where the program will not be able to come up with a solution um, and you'll get an error message and we'll, we'll talk about why that occurs and, and things you can do to try to correct that and troubleshoot those kind of problems. Okay, so we're going to first talk about scaling the loads. And this is important in, to understand that when you're doing power flow, you're trying to simulate the actual system operating conditions. What are the, what's the current in each branch? What, what's the voltage at each bus when the system is operating under some realistic loading condition? Um, so this is different than if you're doing some type of an NEC or code load calculation. Those are two different things. The code is concerned about adequately sizing feeders and breakers and uh, preventing overloads and fires and those kind of things. So it's uh, very conservative. Uh, so it's not going to give you a realistic approximation of what your actual load is going to be for any you know, medium to large size system. So when we first uh, put our loads into EasyPower, everything is taken at uh, connected load. And by that, we mean everything is, assuming, is assumed to be running at 100%. So if I put a 100 horsepower motor in my model, the default is that when I run power flow, the program assumes that motor is at 100 horsepower output, full load amps. And uh, that's true for every load that you put in there initially. Um, and the reality is that running a power flow calculation using strictly connected load is usually not going to provide you with a lot of useful information because very few facilities run at connected load. They're going to run at some lower value of load. And the program doesn't really know what that value is. You have to tell it that by scaling these loads. It will talk a little bit about that. And so in reality, the peak demand for your power system is going to be much slower in most cases than your connected load. And so it's up to you as the user to scale those loads and tell the program uh, what loads you wanted to use to run power flow. And so for every load and every motor there's in database, there's a, there's a power flow tab in the in the motor data that you can click on or in the load data and you can set a scaling factor okay we'll, we'll take a look at how we do that in a, in a few minutes 
Now, in general, you're not going to know the actual load for each individual load in the system. You don't know exactly what every motor is going to be running at. So you're going to have to approximate. And you're going to use the best information that you have and come up with the best approximation that you can. There's some various approaches you can take. You know you should be able to figure out the peak load from your utility bill and ultimately the total load should be something approaching that peak demand load in most cases. Um, we'll see that in easy power you can do group scaling of the loads and the motors to kind of speed up the scaling process. So like if I have a selection area, if I drag a rectangle or select multiple loads, I can scale all those at one time. Now, uh, when it comes to power factor, um, those have to be done individually. So that's not quite as uh, simple to do, but in a lot of cases, you don't have to do too much of that. Um, the other option is to add some capacitors in the system, to, and you can change those sizes easily to kind of adjust the power factor to come up with an answer that matches what your actual data is. And lastly, the power flow is a is an analysis that you're going to typically want to look at different loading conditions. And so that's a good use of the scenario manager. It allows you to scale or store different scaling factors, different switching conditions to do so you can come back and run different power flow scenarios when, whenever you want to, and that's all stored in the same file, same DEZ file. So just a little background on the scaling loads. And so when you first build your model, everything's at 100%. And so you, you will have to go in generally and scale those loads. But let's, let's take a look at an example here, if I can figure out how to do this. OK, so hopefully you can see my uh, one line here. This is actually an actual model that we built some years ago. And we built it to do really arc flash calculation, short circuit, and coordination. And we never did really do power flow calculations for this system. So just so basically all the loads in here are all the motors are at 100% the demand factor. So connected load essentially. So if I if I'll just bring up one of the motors here just as an example. So 350 horsepower. If I go to the power flow, then this is where the program where you set the scaling factor for the motor. Okay. So essentially when you run power flow, let me go back to the specifications tab here. From the horsepower and or the full load amps, if you enter that, and the power factor and efficiency, the program calculates for every motor a KVA value. And that's this value here, 300, in this case, 349.9. So this is the connected load that the program assumes. This 0.82 and 0.91, these are the default power factor and efficiency that the program assigns when you put your motor in the model. So this is essentially is going to give you about one kVA per horsepower, which is the rule of thumb that we've used for a long time in doing design work and basic you know, load calculations. As your motors get larger, these, these values become pretty conservative. So if you have actual data for your motor, you're going to want to enter that here for your larger motors to get a more realistic value. But anyway, the program calculates this value here, the KVA. And then if I go to the power flow tab, you'll see that value shows up here again. So this is the connected load. It then takes the connected load times whatever scaling factor is in this box for this particular motor. In this case, it's 100%. So when I run power flow, this motor is going to be taken at the 349.9 kVA at whatever power factor I had in the uh, specification step. So the program looks at this scaling factor when that does the power flow calcs. If I change this to 80% or 70%, then the program takes the 349 times 0 0.7, 0 0.8, and uses that for the load. So this is the adjustment that you need to make when you're doing power flow. All your loads will need to be scaled to what they're actually going to be running at, or your best 
approximation. Okay, so let's go to uh, Power Flow. So we're in database right now in Easy Power. This is the uh, button to go into the Power Flow Focus. Okay, so now again, this is a model where we have not scaled any of the loads. And I'm just going to show you typically what you see if you run Power Flow on a model where all the loads are at 100% connected load. So I just go up here to solve. Now in Power Flow, remember, I have to solve the entire system because it's balancing out the power in versus the power out and the losses. And the, so I only have one button here I can pick from. So I'm going to do solve. So here's our, these are my results. Just a quick review here. The, these are the power flow values. This, this, this value here is the, in this case, it's megawatts. And the number in parentheses is the reactive power. So this is megavars. You can change this. This is an option. You can change this to uh, different values. If you look under power flow options real quickly here, under one line output, you can show, you have a control over what's displayed here. So right now my branch flows are in megawatts and megavars, generations in MVA and power factor and my loads and the losses KW and KVARs. So the arrows here indicate the direction of real power flow and reactive power. But if I zoom out here a little bit, um, you're going to see a lot of things that turned red. And uh, this is pretty typical. So in easy power, normally when things turn red, that's trying to tell you that it thinks there's a problem. In this case, these voltages are all quite low. Uh, so that's just an issue that there's way more load on the system than is actually going to be there because again it's taking everything at connected load so um, everything here is uh, all these buses are red because of the voltage this is a 92 percent so in reality you're going to have less load than the connected load and so these voltages will not um, be this bad so if you just build your model and then just click on power flow, you're going to see these results and it's going to be kind of disconcerting, but you just realize you haven't really scaled your loads yet to match reality. So while you're in power flow, you can scale these loads as temporary data. Let me find a bigger motor here. So if I go to this motor and double click on it, still in power flow then I get this temporary motor data that I can change while I'm in power flow and then I will have the option to save this back to the database when I go back but if I were to change the scaling factor here from 100% to say 80% when I say okay it's going to rerun this and then this value here is going to go down a little bit so now you can see it went to 80% of the whatever the previous value was. The power factor stayed the same because I didn't change that. Now, this gets a bit tedious to do this. If I got a 500 motors, I have to rescale. So we do give the ability to do this as a group. So you can make whatever selection you want. If I select a group of motors, up here we have a change scaling factor button now. This is, I'm still in power flow. I can do the same thing as a group in database as well. But down here it says uh, scaling factor, so we're going to make them uh, we'll make them all 80%. And so it's going to just ask me to confirm it's changing six motors from 100% to 80%. I'll say yes. And so then it's going to recalculate the, the power flow after I've made those temporary changes. Then you can do the same thing with any other type of load. Uh, so that's a fast way to quickly scale your loads because in reality you're probably not really going to know the actual load on each individual motor. You might have a, some kind of metering up here at the main bus to tell you what the total load is. So then you could scale all these motors so that your total matched what your metering data is. So the further down in the system you have metering data, the more ac accurate your model is going to be basically but that's something you have to tell the program it just doesn't have any way of really figuring that out on its own
Okay, so that's kind of the basics of scaling the loads, and that's an important first step, and that'll take you a little bit of time, come up with the best model that you can, and then you're going to want to probably save that or in your base case or as a scenario indicating peak load, and you can kind of make changes from there. Uh, also point out that the smart breaker feature works in PowerFlow just like uh, short circuit. So if I double click on this breaker, it's basically going to open that and rerun it, and essentially I'm turning this motor off with this breaker is now open. Okay. And when I go back to database from PowerFlow, I get this dialog box that probably looks familiar. It says temporary changes have been made to your system. And uh, it's asking you if you want to save these to the database. So if you say yes here, it's going to, all those scaling factors you changed, it's going to write that into the database. And then you won't have to change those again. So once you do all the scaling, and I'm going to make sure you save that, say yes here. If you just have been making doing some what if things or you don't want to save the changes, just say no. And it'll revert back to whatever it was, whatever things were before you went into PowerFlow. Okay. All right. So that's kind of the basics of the scaling loads. And again, that's an important step that you have to go through in order to really get the value out of the PowerFlow. All right, so let me switch back here uh, to my slides. Okay, so the uh, next thing I want to talk about is um, the things that affect the real power, the KW uh, values that you see in PowerFlow, and contrast that with the uh, the VARs, the reactive power. Okay, so. In power flow, just like in the real world, the energy has to be conserved. So any power that I'm using has to be uh, supplied by some source in the model, either a utility source, could be a generator, uh, could be, um, and now you could have a DC source coming back through some kind of a, an inverter. Or, but and basically, there has to be a source of power that's uh, powering this. UPS, I guess. You have to have a, a power source in order for those all the loads to be satisfied in the program. And the program actually calculates the losses in your cables and transformers, and it takes those into account. So essentially, it's uh, balancing the checkbook in that the power in must equal the power consumed plus the losses minus any power that goes back out. And we'll take a look at that. If you have multiple utility sources, you could have power going the other way. Come in one source and go back out the other source or from your generators. And we'll take a look at that hopefully here in a little bit. So the power consumed is determined by the loads. And that's primarily your motors and other loads and the scaling factors. Remember those? We talked about that earlier. So that the program looks at all those scaling factors, figures out the power being consumed. Now, the fundamental issue in power flow that what makes it complicated is that in most, in the general case, the power that's consumed by the loads is somewhat a function of the voltage. So there's a relationship between the voltage and the actual power that's being consumed by the load. But the voltage that the load sees depends on the load, okay, the total load. So the only way to really solve that accurately in every case is to iterate, and that's that's what the program does, and that's does it extremely quickly. But it does do multiple iterations to balance everything out, and so we we tell the program, you know, because it's a digital program, there's going to be some small error at the end. We we can specify the, the mismatch that we'll tolerate. It's quite a low value down in the watt range. So but the program iterates until it solves that. Now, one of the uh, characteristics of power flow simulations on computers is that it has to have one, because it's doing this iteration, it has to have at least one source where it can draw as much power as it needs or it could actually um, reject power into this source as it needs. And we call that the swing source. Sometimes it will be referred to as a slack source. So in your system, you have to have at least one swing source in order to be able to even go into PowerFlow. 
So if you have a system that's in an island mode, like a, a drill rig off, offshore drilling platform, it just has local generation, at least one of those generators has to be modeled as a swing source. Normally it's going to be the utility, it's going to be your swing source, but you have to have at least one. Now what we'll see in AC power systems is that the voltage, your system voltage, is not really what determines the KW. That's uh, kind of a secondary role. The KW is really set by the power requirements and settings in the sources. So um, if you've ever been around power generation, that'll, that'll make sense to you. You change the voltage, you're going to change the VAR flow, the reactive power flow, and not so much the KW. So it's important to keep that in mind. Now the reactive power, some called VARs, KVARs, kilovars or megavars, volts, amps, reactive. So this essentially is calculated the same way as the KW. Everything has to balance out. You have to have a source of this reactive power, and then you have reactive, this, these VARs being consumed in your inductive loads, basically. Um, so everything has to balance out. But this, this is done completely separate of the KW. So VARs are balanced out separately from the KW. Now we, we talk about sources and losses and all those things with VARs, but it's important to keep in mind that the VARs are not real power. It's not KW. We're simply using them as a convenient way to account for the power factor, the phase angle difference between the voltage and the current at any point. So because of this, as you guys probably all know, that you cannot add VARs and KW directly together. We do have the familiar power triangle. So the total, the KVA is related, the square is related to the sum of the squares of KW and KVARs. Now the VAR flow is related primarily to your system voltage. So the VARs will flow to create the voltage that you need or specify in the system. So small changes in voltage can have a big impact on the VAR flow. And when you have things like your generator in parallel with a source, utility source, um, the reactive power flows to satisfy the voltage set points that you've established before with those sources. So small changes in voltage can have a big impact on your VAR flow. So if you have, let's say, two transformers connected in parallel and one is on a different tap than the other, what happens in easy power and in the real world is you have a huge amount of current flowing between the two transformers. That's essentially all reactive power. And the reason for that is it has to create a voltage drop and whatever impedance is between the two sources to equalize the voltages. So um, it's important where you've got two transformers connected to a common bus that they both be on the same tap. Okay, so let's go look at another example here. We can find it. And I'm going to switch uh, programs here, switch files. All right, so hopefully you can see this model here, if I did this right. Okay, so I have kind of a uh, simplified one line that has a lot of things going on related to power flow. So hopefully I can show you kind of the things we've been talking about. Um, so I've got two sources here, and they're identical, identical transformers two identical generators, and then my only load is a big 10 megawatts and 6 megawatts down here, okay? So if I go to power flow and I go ahead and run solve, you're going to see that everything is completely balanced here. I have the same power flow from both sources. That's because they're both identical, and the transformers are identical, same impedances here, 
If I had different impedances in the transformers, the power flows would not be the same. And my generators are the same as well. They're matched. So this is my voltage. So this is one per unit. It's because I specified that. Up here is 1.01, .01, again, which is a voltage that I told the program for my source, right? And then it creates the power flow and the bar flows necessary to satisfy those conditions, all right? Okay, so you'll notice that I actually have, for the generators, I have 3,000 kilowatts or megawatt, no, 3,000 kilowatts coming out here, 3 megawatts, but my reactive power is going the other direction. It's going into the generator. It's a very small value, but and that's because that's what had to happen in order to maintain this voltage that I told the, I wanted at one per unit with this voltage at 1.1. So these generators are actually running at a leading power factor. I have real power going this way, and I have VARs going into the generator. For a generator, that's a leading power factor. Okay, so I mentioned that the... Uh, the VAR flow was mainly controlled by the voltage. So just as an example here, if I double click on this source, I can change the uh, voltage temporarily. So in my temporary utility data, here's my control voltage. So this is specified. I had set it at 1.01. .01. This is per unit, so 101%. If I change just this one here to 1.02, you're going to see what an impact that has, and it's primarily going to be on the VAR flow here, okay? So if I say okay, hopefully this will run there. So now this has gone way up to 6, because I have to have additional voltage drop. I've got a higher voltage here, and I have to get down to one per unit because that's what I that's what the generators are trying to maintain so what happens is the generators go even further leading they're going now they're absorbing much more reactive power in order to keep this voltage down otherwise this voltage would come up okay so changing this voltage really affects primarily the reactive power the real power changes a little bit because I have more losses now because I have more current, so it has to provide more power to make up for the, the I squared R losses in the system here because of more current, okay? So you'll see that these uh, sources are modeled as swing sources, and that's pretty typical of what you're going to want to do. I'm going to change this back to 0.01, 1.01, so now these are uh, balanced again, okay? Now, um, if we come back and look, basically the program is, I've told the program what the load is, 10 megawatts and 6 megawatts. So that's not going, that's basically as, as long as the uh, voltage is at one per unit here, this is going to stay the same. Now this is defined as a constant MVA load, and that means that as my voltage goes down, it's going to increase the current, so I have the same MVA, constant MVA. That's kind of the default that we use for the loads. We also have the option of constant impedance and constant current here, two other choices. So if I change this to 12 megawatts, then it's going to say, okay, I'm going to come up with 12 megawatts. So it just does that by increasing the power it's taking from the two swing sources. And these values, because of the way I've defined the generators, this stays at 3 megawatts from each. Okay. Okay. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about the uh, how the generators are defined in power flow. 
And let's go back quickly to database. If I double click on the uh, generator, so I have a specifications tab and I can go to my power flow tab. This is where I tell the program how this I want this generator to behave in PowerFlow. So we have the three models here, swing, PV, and PQG. So swing would be a swing source, just like for the utility. And again, if you have a system that's running isolated from the grid in island mode, you're going to have to have one of those generators at least as a swing source. You can have more than one, but you have to have a, at least one. But the default setting for the generators is PV. And the PV mode essentially means I'm going to specify the real power, the megawatts, right here in this box. I say three. So that's what the program's going to produce from the generator, three megawatts. And then the V stands for voltage. So what's going to happen is I'm going to have a set point. I want to maintain a constant voltage here of one per unit. And I can, for the generators, I can specify the bus I want to regulate. In this case, it's the bus it's, they're connected to, main switch gear. Okay. So that's the, uh, where I tell the program, this is PV mode. So essentially the megawatts are set, they're scheduled, as we say in power flow talk, uh, at three megawatts. And this pretty much corresponds to the real world. So the, the meg, the, power production from a generator is set by the prime mover, the turbine or the engine, whatever it is. You set the fuel supply to run at a certain power and then the governor takes care of producing that amount of energy. So it's not uh, sensitive to the voltage as much as it is to the, the input, the energy input into the system. PQG is similar, except in PQG, you're going to specify both the megawatts and the VARs. This is essentially like a power factor control mode. So the way it's sometimes described. So why would you want to use this? Well, if you're operating in parallel with the grid, um, if you have a small generator and a big utility system, it's going to be very difficult for your generator to regulate the voltage. It's not realistic because you don't have enough capacity in the generator to, if the utility voltage drops, then you don't have enough VAR capability in the generator to really bring that voltage back up. So what happens if you try to run it in, in voltage control mode, it's just going from full excitation to full power absorption, going full leading and just constantly back and forth because it can't really control the voltage. So in those cases, you'd set it, you might run in power factor mode, which would be essentially like PQG. So if you want to run at unity power factor, you just set the megawatts to whatever you want and megavars to zero, right? So you'd be running at power factor of one. So if you are if you own a, a power plant and you're selling power to the utility, you basically get paid for what megawatts, not not so much for VARs. So you ideally would like to run at a unity power factor. That kind of has to get worked out with the utility because they would like to have you provide them some VARs as well. But that's the difference here. So the default's going to be the PV. You're going to specify a voltage and a certain megawatt. Now we do allow you to specify a range here for the VARs as it's adjusting the VAR output. These are set really high by default. Um, I would recommend you just leave these at the maximums. Once you get the power flow run, you can go back and look to see if it's still within the range of the machine. If you set these too tight, the program will can give you an error message. When it's doing its iterations, it might hit those limits and give you an error. So if you set these really wide, you'll have fewer problems with the program not converging. Okay. So that's the um, options you have for the generator. Now, in this case, I've got two generators on the same bus. So basically, these have to be in the same operating. You're going to have to have the same voltage set point here, or else it's just not going to work. So the program actually 
I think forces you to do that. These have to have the same voltage set point. So if I go to power flow here, zoom out a little bit, see what kind of trouble I can get into here. All right, so here's our same condition we had before. I set this at one point. Oh, if I double click on this generator, I, I can change this. Let's say we want to make it 1.01. .01. So I'm changing the voltage set point here. Now it actually changed both of these. So what's happening now is to get this voltage up, it's the ex increasing the VARs that are produced. So now these generators are in a lagging mode. They're producing real power and they're exporting VARs, okay, a lot of VARs into the system. So um, these small changes in voltage can have a big impact on your, your VAR flow here. Okay, so that's, that's the impact of changing the voltage set point here for the generator. But conversely, if I if I change the megawatts, then it's just changing. I still have the same 10 megawatts down here, so it's just changing the relationship between these two, and it doesn't really affect the VARs here. Really, don't change at all. So. Okay, so. Just remember where you have multiple generators on a common bus, you're going to have to have the same, if they're in PV mode, you're going to have to have the same voltage setting um, or else it's going to be a problem. Um, let's talk for a minute about uh, multiple swing sources and we'll use our same uh, little model here. Let's go back to database real quick just to see what this looks like in database. So I have my specifications tab and I have a power flow tab. So I have the same three options here that I we looked at for the generator, but generally your utility source is going to be your swing source. And we have the same options, but and I can have more than one swing source. So if I went to this one, this is also a swing source. And this is the voltage. Um, this voltage setting, again, only affects power flow. So I've got it at 101%. So if I have two swing sources, what controls the real power? How much power comes from this source versus how much comes from this source? And the answer really comes back to uh, impedance differences, source impedance differences, and this control angle here. So this is the, the power angle between these two sources. So if one source leads the other, power is going to flow from the one that's ahead to the one that's behind. Okay. So this is typical if you had a big transmission substation where you got power flowing in and out there's going to be a phase angle difference between those two sources and that's what controls the power flow not the voltage what controls the power flow is this phase angle here in an AC system and these are very small numbers now in easy power these are in degrees from 0 to 360 it doesn't like negative numbers so if you want minus 1 you have to put in 359 but um, I'm going to change well, let me go back. I'll do this in power flow. So I can change it back a little bit easier. So go back to power flow. I'll rerun this. Okay. So now these are right now these are, the power flow is identical between the two. If I click on the utility source two, I'm going to change the control angle down here from zero to one. One degree difference in the power angle between these two sources, and we're going to see what happens. So you can see a drastic change. So essentially, this power went way up. And uh, in this case, I actually turned the power around. So this one degree difference, now I've got power that's flowing through my system and back out. 
right? So that's how we regulate um, the power flow between the two swing sources. Now, in general, you're, you're not going to know that. You'll have to tell the program that power angle, control angle, it doesn't really have any way of figuring that out. So you'll have to base that on some uh, actual metering data or just uh, set that to achieve the answer that you want as far as the relative power in and out. But that's how it's controlled. So you can have as many of these swing sources as you want. But if you make, you need to make these changes in the control angle between the sources, you're quite small or else you can get some fairly drastic changes in the results. So again, that's the this control angle. And this is at one degree, OK? If I wanted to go minus one, I'd put 359 in here, I think. And now it's just it's going the other direction, right? So I got power going around this way. Okay. So by default, these are set at zero. Okay. Uh, Next topic is uh, load tap changers. And I'm back in database. Let's just take a look at the transformer for a second. A couple things I wanted to point out. In the specifications tab, we have a column here for rated KV. This would be the nominal voltage on the transformer nameplate, not necessarily your bus voltage here, but what's actually on the transformer nameplate. And then typically these transformers are going to have no load tap changers or offload tap changers. And that's this tap KV. So if for power flow, this is very important that you capture this data when you're doing your data collection. You need to look at, find out what tap this transformer is on, if at all possible. Uh, it could be difficult if it's internal, but Hopefully you can get that from the uh, plant staff. But this, these values will affect your power flow results pretty dramatically. So norm, on a normal transformer, these no load taps are going to be on the primary side, the high voltage side. That's a little bit easier. And it can be either in KV directly, which should be on the nameplate as well, or it can be in percent. So this is the no load tap changer. You're going to want to set those Make sure you get that data and reflect that in um, if you're going to be doing power flow because that will affect your results. So if you change this tap, so you go 2.5%, it's going to change all your voltages by 2.5% basically because you're changing the turns ratio of the transformer. Okay. So in addition to this, the no load tap changer, we also allow you to model what we call a load tap changer or, or an on load tap changer. This is essentially a little little auto transformer that's hung on the back of the end of the transformer normally on the low side that will automatically adjust usually plus or minus 10 percent and allow you the, the transformer automatically there's a little controller automatically adjust the taps to maintain whatever voltage you set in the set point so if I click on the load tap changer tab the default here is none the program allows you to put it on either side um, so Generally, it's going to be on the low side, uh, but uh, not necessarily. But if we, if you want to model the load tap changer, and again, this is only going to affect the power flow. If we click on this, then we see the step size. This is a standard uh, where you have 32 steps to cover plus or minus 10%. It comes out to 0.625. This is the, you can specify a range here again, but like the uh, the VAR range in the generators, we like to leave this pretty wide. It helps with running power flow. And then just like the generators, we have a set point. So right now this is set to 1.01. So that's going to regulate whatever bus this, the two side is connected to, which is down here. So if I say OK and set it to 1.01, if I go to power flow, 
I see this helpful message that said the power flow convergence is unstable. And so what's happening here is I've told the program that I want to maintain, I want the transformer to maintain 1.01 voltage here, but the generators are trying to maintain 1.0. So the regulator, the load tap changer, and the voltage regulators are fighting each other. And so that's what's causing this error, I think. It also gives you a little report down here you could look at. But in our case, if I simply go in now and change this, well, I got to go back to database. Sorry. If I go back to database and change this set point to 1.00 to match what I have the generators for, then it should run. It's going to adjust this tap slightly, and it's. So that's why you now you see slightly different power flow from this source and this source because the regulator is, is now the voltage regulator load tap changer is now in the picture so anytime you have regulators load tap changers and voltage regulators on generators connected to the same bus or in the same system there's the potential for those things to kind of fight each other uh, and that applies in the, in the real world as well. Okay, so that's just an example of how we do that. Um, so we can model that. Now in, while you're in database, you, you can turn that off, or power flow, you can turn that off temporarily just to, if you have some kind of a problem you're trying to deal with. Um, if you have a utility, you have step type voltage regulators, like in your substation, you can model that as a basically a one-to-one -one transformer here with a load tap changer, and you'll get the same effect. The program will automatically adjust these taps to maintain a certain voltage here. Okay, so the last topic really is to, just to kind of go through a few issues you can run into. We saw that error, power flow is unstable, or we can get similar messages where it, it won't converge. Those convergence issues are diverging. Um, so let me go back to my uh, slideshow here. When you first go into power flow and you run it and you get errors, the first thing to check is to make sure you have the right transformer generator ratings, source ratings, the right voltages. Make sure you have KVA where you want KVA and not MVA for the transformers. And for the sources, make sure you have the right voltage in for the source. Um, sometimes you can get the two voltages in the transformer reverse and that can cause the problem. And make sure you've entered the volts of course, in easy power, the voltages have to be in kV instead of volts. So you want to make sure you have those right. So that's the most common things in terms of the modeling that can make the power flow complain. And the simplest way to find those is just to deactivate parts of the system. Um, you can do a group selection and deactivate, run the power flow. Just keep deactivating pieces of the system until you get it to run and then you can go through and start putting things back in and see where it blows up again and you can narrow it down that way. So that, that's one approach you can take. Um, so it's important to you know verify all your modeling data. Now if you have generators you have more uh, things you can play with there are more settings so you have more chances of having the program not being able to solve your power flow model so the common things are the generators hitting the VAR limits like we looked at a minute ago, the load tap changers hitting their voltage limits. We saw the different voltage setting between the load tap changer and the generators. So if you turn off the load tap changer action, block that, that can help a little bit. Now if you have a situation where you have loads in your model that greatly exceed your source capacity, potentially you have like a small generator, you know, if you've got 100 times the load that you have generation capacity, sometimes we get a voltage collapse condition in the analysis and it, it cannot solve that either. So in addition to D 
deactivating the system, you can go in and just start double clipping on breakers to open those up to reduce the load. You could try setting the generators to a PQG mode and just schedule the VARs and the watts and see if you can get it to run. Uh, the set point changes, you want to make very small changes to those incrementally, uh, not over 1% at a time to see if you can get it to run. And once you get it to run, you can kind of back into what you really want to evaluate start reactivating pieces of the system, you know, slowly uh, adjusting your voltage back to where you want and just kind of see where it's, where the problems are, okay. So um, you do have the option to increase the number of iterations in the uh, control settings in PowerFlow. My experience is that's usually not going to help much. It's going to converge pretty quickly or it's not going to converge. So. You can look at the summary reports and the mismatch reports. It's important to sort of just make one change at a time, so you, like anything else when you're troubleshooting. If all else fails, we'll be happy to help you in tech support. And you can just email us with your problem and the conditions and just go ahead and send us your DEZ file and then we'll, we'll try to work through it and, and figure out what's going on with your uh, power flow model and why it can't solve. Okay. So. Hopefully that's that's been helpful. Um, just remember that the key thing in PowerFlow is scaling those loads. And uh, once you get get a model that matches your actual loading conditions, and you can kind of start from there and do all the other things you want to you want to do with PowerFlow. So I want to thank thank you all for joining us, and come back again uh, next week for another uh, webinar. And uh, if you have any questions on Easy Power, feel free to contact Tech Support at uh, at any time, and they'll be glad to help you out. So, thanks, guys, and we'll talk to you again soon.